Welcome, everybody. I'm Nick Williams. I'm the vice president. Our president had to go on to something else. So welcome to you all and, of course, to our speaker. We have Dr. Wallace Wong from the ARC Centre of Excellence in Exciton Science, who will present and discuss emerging solar photovoltaic technologies with a focus on Australian and Victorian research. Dr. Wong was born in Hong Kong, educated in Sydney, Oxford and Zurich. He's currently a senior lecturer at the School of Chemistry at Melbourne and is the chief investigator in the ARC Centre of Excellence in Exciton Science. His research interest is in functional organic materials, synthesis, characterization, and applications in light harvesting, chemical sensing, and biological imaging. Please welcome Wallace Wong. So just before we get started, I'll follow what David usually does and ask you how you got interested in science. Okay, um, uh, my reason for getting into science is pretty simple, nothing deep there. I like the beauty of objects, of art, of drawings, and I like the beauty of molecules. So I got into making them. Well, yeah. from another chemist, that's marvellous. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wallace. Thank you. Okay. So today I'm going to tell you something about energy and uh, how we get it from the sun. Uh, but I'll have a fairly lengthy introduction to it before I get into the new technologies, just to set the scene. So where does energy come from? I guess for most Australians, our electricity comes from coal or our transportation that requires oil. But if one thinks more carefully about that, actually most of the energy on Earth originates from the sun. And now I want to tell just a small uh, story about uh, journey of energy. So the lights in this room and the light coming out of the projector, it's powered by electricity generated from power plants, um, most likely coming from the brown coal fire power plants in the Latrobe Valley. The power, these power plants burn coal um, that has been sitting in the ground for hundreds of millions of years. And the coal takes tens of millions year, of, of years to uh, form from dead plant material. These prehistoric plants, which, from which the coal com uh, comes from, uh, capture energy from sunlight. Um, while these plants can probably uh, convert sunlight and organic matter uh, into organic matter in a matter of uh, days, weeks, or months, uh, it does take hundreds and thousands of years to accumulate enough of it uh, for the geological coal formation process. So ultimately, the light comes from the sun. In fact, it's coming from the surface of the sun at 5,500 5, degrees. And this temperature, this heat, is coming from the core of the sun. Uh, the core of the sun is at 15 million degrees uh, and 265 billion atmospheres. So under this enormous temperature and pressure, nuclear fusion happens. Um, hydrogen is converted into helium. Uh, in fact, it's been estimated that uh, 700 million tons of hydrogen is converted to 693 million tons of helium every second. Um, the 7 uh, million tons uh, mass um, every second, and this mass is converted into energy, E equals to mc squared. That's a lot of energy. Uh, and most of this energy is electromagnetic radiation, light. Um, so I've already told you this story. So the question is then how long does it take for, before we can access these energy sources? As I said, if we're burning fossil fuels, if we're using coal, uh, that's, uh, it's millions of years process. Uh, if we're just uh, burning biomass, using biomass, plants require months to years or, or years to grow. But if we're using uh, a solar technology like a solar cell, a photovoltaic cell, light can be converted into electrical current in a matter of microseconds. Now, uh, I want to just frame the problem a little bit, give you some ideas of the scale of energy uh, here. 
So this is a graphic of the world energy consumption. It's quite an old one that I took somewhere from the internet. Uh, it goes up to only 2010. Uh, but you can see here that uh, around 2010, we're already consuming more than 500 exajoules per year. So what is this number, exajoules? To put it in perspective, if you will, the annual Australian energy consumption is around six exajoules, and the US uses around 100 exajoules. And in fact, an exajoule is one quintillion joules of energy, a lot of zeros, as you can see on the slides here. And again, just to put it in perspective, uh, the earthquake, the big earthquake that happened in Japan that caused the nuclear power plant meltdown back in 2011, that was estimated to be 1.4 exajoules. And the largest man-made nuclear explosion is 0.2 exajoules. Now, um, how fast are we using uh, energy? So up till 2017, that was the last number that I was able to find, uh, we're using 18 terawatts uh, of energy at this rate. And it's projected that we'll be using uh, 28 terawatts by 2050, and by, 20, uh, by 2100, we'll be using 43 terawatts. Okay, just to give you a perspective on what, how big this number is, one terawatt is one trillion watts, or uh, 100 billion 10-watt LED bulbs. A few years ago, I used to put 100-watt light bulbs, lunch and fill-in button bulbs, but everyone is using LEDs now. Uh, anyway, a lot of light bulbs. And uh, watt is joules per second, so that's a rate of using energy. Um, and if you, we translate that, just to put it in more perspective, you can, a Big Mac is around 2,300 kilojoules. Uh, so one terawatt would be 43,500 Big Macs per second. And for those of you who don't eat fast food, if you drink a latte or a glass of wine, that would be 200,000 glasses of wine or cups of latte per second. So um, there was uh, a scientist, Richard Smalley. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry back in uh, 1996 for the discovery of fullerenes, in fact. But he was really into um, future global energy prosperity. And he gave a talk uh, back in the early 2000s uh, about future global energy prosperity. Um, he's, he was also a very strong advocate of training scientists and engineers to deal with peak oil, uh, climate change, and these sorts of issues. And in his talk uh, back in the early 2000s, he, he discussed this problem of energy prosperity. And he said, um, top 10 problems that humanity will face in the next 50 years, he had a list. In his opinion, number one is energy, followed by water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism, and war, disease, which I think in this environment right now, we'll probably move that a few, up a few spots, uh, education, democracy, and population. Now, and he also said that if we were to give all 10 billion people on the planet the same level of energy prosperity that we're used to in the developed world, uh, that's, he estimated to be a couple of kilowatt hours per person, uh, we would need to generate 60 terawatts on the planet, and that's equivalent to 900 billion barrels of oil. Uh, I think at the moment we're consuming around 100 million, 100 million barrels, so 900 million barrels is a lot. So how do we meet this energy challenge? You can imagine perhaps building one gigawatt power plant per day for the next 30 years, but if we were to do that, that's one gigawatt power plant per day. That would only give us 10 extra terawatts. And the sun provides us with much, much more energy rate than that. So the sun delivers 165,000 terawatts of energy to the earth continuously. And definitely solar has the potential to fill the gap, but how do we harvest this? Um, and yeah, I've got some pictures of uh, plow plants here, because when I was researching this, uh, I wondered myself, how, you know, how big is a one gigawatt power plant? Um, I don't know. Uh, so this, this, the top picture is actually a picture before the meltdown of the uh, Fukushima power, uh, nuclear power plant. The Fukushima power plant, when it was operational at full capacity, was five gigawatts. Um, those 
30 coal fire power plants in the Latrobe Valley. Uh, the Yalan one is 1.5 gigawatts. The Loyang at maximum capacity is around 3 gigawatts. The Snowy Hydro is around 4. And if you, it's Snowy 2.0, if that happens, it will add an extra 2 gigawatts. Um, the biggest wind farm in the world is in China, and that's a 20 gigawatt wind farm. The Free Gorgeous Dam, the biggest hydro project in the world in China, is 22 gigawatts. Uh, and at the moment, at this stage, the largest solar park is in India at 2 gigawatts. So that gives you an idea of what, what's out there in terms of power plants and what the challenges of having to build one gigawatt power plant per day and just producing 10 terawatts. This graphic shows um, you know, we're in the, the sun irradiance, as I said, we're getting 165,000 terawatts. The world energy demand right now is around 18 terawatts. The current PV, installed PV, is at 0.5 terawatts. And actually, just a few years ago, when I was still giving public lectures like this, I was quoting numbers that are much lower. So you can see here, you know, if I was giving this talk back in 2010, it was much smaller number. So we've, we're, we're doing well, um, but I guess we're still a long way to go if you're just talking about uh, solar cell installations. The other graphic I want to show is this one here on this slide. In the same talk uh, by Richard Smalley, he also showed uh, um, an estimate from another scientist, Nate Lewis, uh, professor at Caltech. So back in the early 2000s when all this was being discussed, he estimated that uh, if we have six solar farms uh, with area 100 by 100 square uh, kilometers, uh, panels area, and if those solar cells were 10% efficient, uh, that would give us approximately 20 terawatts of energy. That sounds very attractive, right? You just need one uh, sort of very large solar farm in each continent and probably that would do. But of course, the problem's not that simple. You need to get the energy to where you need it. You need to find ways to store it. And um, back then, the cost of PV of solar cells uh, are still relatively high. So, what solar technologies are available to us right now? So, of course, in this talk, I'm going to mainly talk about solar cells, uh, but um, most of you would be aware that we have solar thermal. Some of you might have solar thermal uh, on your roof to heat your swimming pool or solar thermal to, for use in a shower. So that's great. Solar thermal is great to heat water, but it's less great if you want to use the hot water than to generate electricity. So there's a limitation there for solar thermal in terms of the efficiency. And the other up and coming area that's still very much in the research phase is this solar fuel. So photovoltaics changes sunlight into electricity, that's fine for a lot of applications, but in many applications that we still have today need, requires a fuel. So it would be great to be able to convert sunlight directly into a liquid fuel. fuel. And in fact, this, uh, and one of the few that people talk about, of course, is hydrogen. Uh, in fact, this picture that I'm showing here is a, a laboratory-based uh, device that can convert sunlight uh, uh, and directly use that energy to split water into uh, hydrogen and oxygen. M much more research that needs to be done there still to improve efficiency and stability. Solar fuels is definitely a very important research area. Um, so at the moment, uh, we can make hydrogen from sunlight. Uh, we use solar cells, we make electrical current, we do electrolysis of water to get oxygen and hydrogen. So that's possible, uh, and people talk about hydrogen economy. But you know, hydrogen is perhaps not so convenient to transport and store, so actually we probably want a, a higher density or a, 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 more, a, a higher structure fuel. Uh, you know, like maybe methanol or ethanol. While there is currently processes to produce that, um, they're less efficient and usually not directly from sunlight. It's important to have both solar fuels and solar photovoltaics. If we are able to produce electricity efficiently, we'll probably use the electricity for most things, uh, including producing more fuel. Um, but, you know, um, it would be very uh, convenient and more efficient if we can do that directly, changing sunlight into fuel. So, solar cells. 
what's available. At the moment, solar cells, uh, if you've got solar cells on your roof, it's most likely going to be a silic made of silicon, so crystalline silicon solar cells. Uh, and that's the picture here, these blue panels. But uh, other commercially available solar cells are these gallium arsenide or multi-junction solar cells. These are more efficient, uh, but uh, more expensive. What's also available are less efficient thin film uh, technology, and I'll talk more about that as we go. And then the other uh, emerging technologies are uh, polymer solar cells, perovskite solar cells, and quantum dot solar cells. Every time I give a solar talk, uh, even if it's a public lecture, I feel like showing this graphic, even though nobody can read it because everything's so small. Uh, you can download this from the NREL uh, website. So NREL, that's the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the US. It summarizes the best research cell efficiency. So this is just talking about efficiency. It's not talking about costs or stability or anything like that. And these are research cells, not modules, commercial modules. But it gives you a good summary on where emerging technologies are at relative to uh, available ones. Uh, one thing, so this blue line right in the middle of this graphic here with uh, solid squares is the silicon technology. So you can see that it's at a good efficiency for a long time, but hasn't really moved anywhere. And that's because silicon is more or less already at the efficiency, theoretical efficiency limit. Uh, this region down here in the uh, graph is where all the emerging technologies are. And one is getting quite close to where silicon is. And I'll talk, briefly talk about that. Uh, and right up here, where the efficiency are getting close to 50%, so that's 52 up there, these are the more expensive uh, solar technologies, these multi-junction solar cells uh, used in concentrators. So um, you'll be using uh, 100, 500, 1,000 suns using mirrors to focus sunlight onto these cells to have the efficiency at that level. So just, I'm going to show that NREL graph a couple of more times just to illustrate a few things. Now, silicon solar cells, um, uh, what's involved in that? I want to talk about this first before I talk about the emerging technology so you can see, uh, see the difference or know the difference. This is a picture of silicon solar cells on Wilson Hall at the University of Melbourne. Many people have solar panels, silicon solar panels on the roofs, but you may not know what's actually in them or what's it made out of. So they're silicon. They uh, consist of these silicon wafers which are all uh, connected together into a module. And these modules are all encased in layers of glass so that it's, uh, you can handle it stable. But of course, all this bulk, uh, it adds weight, uh, which is uh, one of the things that are uh, perhaps not so great about silicon solar cells. The other thing about silicon is uh, where does silicon come from? You know, silicon is a common uh, element. Uh, it's come, it's comes from silicon dioxide. It's from sand, so it should be cheap. And it is cheap, but in terms of energy, it's probably not so cheap. You have to use a lot of heat and energy to convert the silicon dioxide, this sand crystals here, into pure silicon. And in fact, the process that is involved in producing pure silicon requires temperatures up to 1,800 degrees. And it requires many, many processes to get up to a level of purity required for a silicon solar cell to operate efficiently. So there's a big embedded energy cost uh, in silicon solar cells. Now, I want to talk about this energy and monetary payback time. And then later on, I can also then talk about these uh, parameters for the emerging technologies. So let's talk about money first. Everyone probably was more worried about money first than energy payback. Uh, at the moment, uh, a current PV system in Australia is costing around a dollar per watt. So if you get a five kilowatt system, which you, what you, is what you might get for a residential property, uh, it's around $5,000. And with the current uh, cost of electricity in Victoria and the uh, amount of sunlight we're getting in Melbourne, a five kilowatt system will pay itself back in around six years. So in fact, in, um, it's estimated that if you're in South Australia where the electricity prices are a lot higher, uh, it would only take two or three years to get your uh, money back. Now, of course, that's important for our hip pockets, but we should also be worried about how long does it take for us 
uh, to get the energy back because it requires a, a lot of energy to make the, these devices. Uh, and that's this parameter, energy payback time. So in energy payback time calculations, of course, there's a lot of assumptions, but uh, usually uh, you would include things like uh, energy required to mine, the materials that goes into it, transportation, refining, production, assembling the modules, uh, packaging it, and then deploying it, and also finally the recycling of these devices after it's done with its work. So if you take all those parameters into account, then you can uh, do an estimate, do a calculation of the energy payback time. And uh, at the moment, uh, with the current efficiencies, and if you're in a good sunny location, the energy payback time for a silicon solar cell uh, would be, uh, can be around two years. So that's okay, I suppose. And so in a minute, we'll discuss what the emerging technologies can do. Let's talk about thin film uh, cells. So, oh, by the way, I didn't forgot to mention. So for silicon solar cells, uh, other than it all being encased in glass, the silicon wafers that is the main component of the silicon solar cell is quite thick. Um, uh, it's in the hundreds of micrometers thickness. Uh, so, um, you know, there's certain limitations when you have uh, such thick uh, pieces of silicon. You can get thinner devices, and here's uh, some uh, of those technologies here. So, uh, these thinner devices are thin enough now that you can have flexible or conformal um, devices. So, then it lends to different sort of applications. Um, so here's a picture of a person sticking, I think, I believe, uh, amorphous silicon solar cells, or actually it could be cadmium telluride solar cells on a roof. But it does come at a, a, a efficiency cost. Uh, these thin film solar cells are not as efficient as the silicon solar cells. And then there's also uh, these emerging technologies, uh, which are all uh, thin film based devices. And here, in the next few slides, I'm going to show you just some pictures and just uh, talk through these a little bit uh, and show you the advantages of having uh, thin film solar cells and also uh, what these, some of these emerging technologies offer. So with thin film, with these amorphous silicon and cameron teroride and these types of solar cells, you, it's flexible, so you can imagine much more portable applications. Here's a couple of pictures. I believe you can still order these on the internet, so you can have a bag and you can have a roll to take camping, if you will. I don't see many people using these things anymore for their cars to block sun. I know that back in the 90s, that was quite popular. But yeah, I guess it's a good idea to have something like that. So it offers flexibility in film solar cells. And so with some of these newer technologies, uh, you can also get uh, a variety of different colors. That might be important for certain applications. Uh, where you might want a certain look for your device. Yeah, this one is an interesting example here. They uh, used, um, I believe, a Dyson size solar cell uh, on a car roof. And then in the same device, they also put a uh, light emitting device. So during the day, then you have the solar cells collecting light. And then I guess when it's dark, you can have uh, your, the inside of your car lit by what the energy is absorbed by the solar cell during the day. With these uh, technologies, you can also have uh, more building integrated type applications. This one is an example of a conference center in Switzerland, in Lausanne. One of the big solar cell research groups is based in Lausanne. Uh, and um, yeah, these color panels here are actually Dyson size solar cells. This is the Alan Gilbert building at the University of Melbourne. Uh, there are actually some solar cells at the top, but th these are actually silicon solar cells in the integrated into the glass. This is a, a picture that some of you may have seen before. So if you go to the zoo often, like me, I go to the zoo quite often. I have a young child, so I take him there a lot of time. Outside the butterfly house uh, in the Melbourne Zoo, um, there's an installation here of uh, some polymer solar cells. Uh, these are printed at CSIRO and now uh, it's a demonstration of that particular technology. We need to make use of all technologies available to us. So at the moment, uh, at least for solar cells, um, we can convert uh, sunlight easily into electricity um, and we're using silicon solar cells. So 
that's going to be with us for a long time. And then with all the emerging technologies that are coming along, thin film solar cells, organic solar cells, uh, perovskite solar cells, solar concentrators, we need to use all of them for different types of applications. So it's a few years ago now, but I thought I'd show this slide. The University of Melbourne had an advertising campaign promoting research, and one of the research areas that promoted was what we were doing uh, with uh, thin film and flexible solar cells, and the slogan, or oh, the title they came up with was making any surface solar. And yeah, I guess it's true. You could possibly make any surface solar. Just let's see uh, when we can do that. That's a picture of me. I think the installation they had was uh, at outside um, South and Cross Station. Okay, the research program that uh, we were doing back then, so this uh, is, uh, we started probably printed solar cells back in 2009-ish, so it's already more than a decade ago. Uh, but um, there was a big program uh, in Victoria to develop printed solar cells, uh, particularly of the organic and diacinthized type solar cells. Um, and yeah, so this uh, particular slide shows you what is involved in a printed solar cell and an organic one. So basically, it's a plastic sandwich, a printed solar cell. Usually I bring like a roll of it to show people, but you can see it on this picture here. The active layer material um, for an organic solar cell is, are these compounds here. So these can be dissolved in solution, make it into an ink, which can be printed row to row. Um, and so you can see the row here. Uh, and in this way, these devices should be able to be manufactured uh, cheaply and quickly. And, and really, uh, my research interest is, in fact, in the development of these materials. So I'm an organic chemist, actually. So on this slide, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about these materials. I won't go into like the synthesis of it, uh, but I at least want to show what they are. Um, because you know, many people wouldn't, wouldn't know what organic semiconductors are. So organic semiconductors, what are they? Hopefully, most people know what semiconductors are. Organic molecules, we have carbon-carbon bonds. These bonds involve, I guess, sharing of electrons between two carbon atoms. And in a normal, in a typical organic molecule, uh, these electrons wouldn't move too far from this area between the two carbon atoms. So most organic compounds are insulators, uh, like you know, a plastic cup or a plastic chair. For an organic semiconductor, imagine a benzene ring. In a benzene ring, uh, you have uh, two types of bonding. One type of bonding is this pi bonding. The pi bonding allows the electrons to move freely over this benzene molecule. So if I was to string a few benzene molecules together, fuse them together, and make a molecule like this called pentacene. You can now imagine perhaps that the electrons can move freely around this whole molecule because of this pi bonding. What's more is if you were to make it, have a crystal of pentacene where uh, there is ordered packing of these molecules, the electrons in these pi bonds can then hop between the molecules. So then you can get some sort of electron conduction and therefore a semiconducting material. And with organic compounds, um, you can do a lot of uh, tuning of structure in order to change the properties. So we're not restricted to just that pentacene molecules that, that I showed you. Uh, in fact, we can change the structure of these mo organic molecules as long as we keep this uh, conjugation, this uh, pi bonding de delocalization through the molecules we can have an organic semiconductor. But at the same time, we can tune the photophysical properties or the color of these materials. So then we can have different applications. Um, for an inorganic semiconductor like silicon, um, it just has one color. Um, and I'll, in a few slides, I'll talk about band gap. But I'll uh, explain when I get there. Okay, and just to go through a little bit more of what we did, 
what I was involved in previously. Again, this was the project, as I mentioned, a few years ago now. Uh, we developed materials. Uh, we tested them in small lab scale devices. We scaled up the materials. We printed them, made large area devices, tested them outdoors for stability. And all this whole program, I guess, built capacity of research in Victoria and as well as in Australia. And yeah, a lot of research groups now uh, that are, are currently running uh, benefited from um, this research activity. So uh, now there's still such research activity going on funded by the Re Renewable Energy Agency through this Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics. Okay, yeah, at, and at around the same time, um, so of course, Australia is not the only place that this research is happening. Uh, many groups in Europe and all the, the US doing this research. Uh, in this particular video, um, so this video shows a couple of people pushing a roller, rolling out some organic solar cells. So uh, there's a, uh, there is a group in Denmark that is really into particularly uh, the engineering aspects of uh, the uh, printed organic solar cells. So they set up this in a paddock and start rolling them out. Um, and in fact, the, the lead researcher uh, of this group, um, Professor Frederick Krebs, um, he has written a few articles on um, this technology. Uh, and I guess one of the interesting ones that I want to share with you uh, is one where he uh, discusses the life cycle and energy analysis of organic solar cells. Uh, in fact, this publication down here at the bottom of the slide. In this article, and it's a few years ago now, so maybe things have even improved because of uh, development of the technology. The technology at the time, he estimated that the energy payback time was between one and three years This for this organic solar cell. But with improvements in fabrication processes and then using renewable feedstocks and using renewable energy to produce these solar cells, he estimated that the energy payback time can be as low or as short as one day. So I think that's great. You know, if we can get to that, that's fantastic. And um, yeah, so and I just want to quickly talk about a, uh, this particular solar cell technology. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because um, I believe later on um, uh, this year, uh, as part of the Exoton Science Light Conversation public lecture series, there will be a, a talk specifically on perovskites and perovskite solar cells. But um, this particular material, this perovskite, uh, in the last few years has really be, become the uh, most interesting solar cell material. Uh, in fact, um, so you can see here that you can, it's uh, solution processable, you so you can print it, but its device efficiency is uh, currently the lab-based device record is 25%, so that's matching that of silicon in the lab. It has some issues, and uh, perhaps that will be discussed in a later talk. But we uh, uh, at the Exoton Science Center uh, certainly is uh, working on, on that, uh, and mainly uh, with researchers at Monash University and at CSIRO. Um, I think recently they, they demonstrated that you can do a large area printed perovskite solar cell that is 10% efficient. We want large scale usage, so in solar farms would be great. One particular technology we make use of is to combine a light harvesting device with a silicon solar cell to make it more efficient. So if you already have a solar farm with silicon solar panels, and if you could just simply put a film of this other material to collect more light, then that, that would be great. Okay, um, I've gone through all this time in my talk and you know, I'm from the Exoton Science Center. I still haven't explained what are excitons. Um, so uh, here it is. Yeah, so what are excitons? Um, excitons are created when light is absorbed by material. I guess very simply, and you can read the dot points there, but I think the very simplest picture is if you imagine an atom, uh, it's got electrons moving around a nucleus with a certain energy. If, this, if light is absorbed, then the electrons pick up more energy. And in this state where 
the electron has more energy, but still somehow associated with the nucleus, then that's an exciton. And what can we do with that? So after absorption of light, what can we do with it? Well, of course we can, as we've already talked about, so uh, we can absorb light and convert the light into electrical current. So that's when ex an exciton is uh, split into the electron and the positive charge. Okay, that's the solar cell. But actually, I guess more often than not, when, a light, when light is absorbed by a material, we get heating of the material, or where vibrations are produced. Uh, so that's what typically happens. Uh, the other thing that can happen is uh, we can get uh, emission of the energy, so that's fluorescence. I guess I should also mention here on this picture that you can also inject charges into materials, into a semiconducting material, and if these charges recombine, you can get an exciton, and then the exciton can emit light, and that's how a, a light-emitting diode works. The other thing that I haven't really talked about, and I've talked a lot about solar cells, is uh, how do they actually work. Um, and in fact, I'm not going to really talk about how they work. I show this a particular slide um, because I want to talk about uh, another concept that I want to introduce um, in order to talk of, into the, move into the next part of my talk, and that's band gap. So when a material absorbs light, uh, you get the exciton, and then in a solar cell, you can get electrical current. However, if uh, th this photon that is absorbed has to be at appropriate energy. So if your photon the light, if it doesn't have enough energy to move the electron up to here, then uh, it won't be absorbed. So in other words, uh, anything that's less than this gap here, any light that's less in energy than that gap will not be used in a solar cell. And what's more is if anything that is absorbed, uh, a light that is absorbed but is, has a high energy, so let's say, uh, uh, the electron is promoted up to about here on this particular picture. Um, it has to move down in energy to this level. And all this uh, energy moving from here down to here is lost as heat. So because of this, um, solar cells have a limited uh, efficiency. And this gap here we call band gap in a semiconducting material. I guess to look at it another way, if you, if you were looking at it, it uh, from a, a solar spectrum perspective, so you know if your solar material absorbs light up to say 700 nanometers, then you wouldn't be absorbing any of these photons in the near infrared, and that's like half of the uh, energy from the sun. Uh, and any photons that say you absorb at 400 nanometers, so that's the high energy photons a lot of that extra energy would be lost as heat. So the theoretical analysis of this was done quite a few years ago. In fact, um, back in 1960s uh, by these two scientists here. And yeah, it's basically based on the band gap of the various photovoltaic materials. And you can see here that uh, depending on this band gap, uh, the maximum efficiency uh, is, can vary from you know, close to zero, up to over 30%. But with a single photovoltaic, single solar cell material, you're not going to get efficiency higher than around 30. So are there ways to improve this, uh, or exceed this limit? Is there a way to improve uh, light harvesting? So yeah, getting back to this very extremely busy NREL graph. I mentioned multi-junction solar cells. Um, some of you might know what those are, some of you may not, so I'll just quickly talk about them. These are devices that are fairly efficient at in this part of the chart, 40% uh, around here if it's, uh, I think, one sun. Uh, but if it's concentrated, you can get concentrated sunlight, you can get up to nearly 50%. That's great, but these devices are complicated to produce. Uh, and what's more is that, because they are multi-layer devices, and what's more is that they typically involve uh, more rare elements like gallium and indium, making them more expensive. 
Uh, and you can see here, I guess this shows, illustrate nicely what a multi-junction solar cell does. So one part of the solar cell absorbs the high energy light, and then another section absorbs the medium energy light, and then the last part absorbs the low energy light. So it's good, high efficiency, but it's expensive. So we, it's unlikely we're going to use at least this type of multi-junction solar cell in large area, large power generation. So what else can you do? So I guess then we can think of ways to make use of those low energy photons or low energy light, uh, and also the high energy photons or high energy light. So the two things that are marked in the red rectangles there uh, are ways to make use of low energy light. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, up conversion briefly here uh, in the next few slides. And then uh, ones in the blue rectangles are the ways you can make use, better use of the high energy photons. And I'm going to briefly also talk about one of these, this multi exciton generation. So uh, photon up conversion, that's one of the ways that we can convert low energy light into high energy light. How do we do that? What happens with photon up conversion is what, what's needed? Well, actually, to begin with, typically for a material when it absorbs light and if it emits a photon, so if it's a fluorescent material, the emission would be lower in energy than the absorption. So that's a typical fluorescent material. So it is a little bit unusual then to find a material that would absorb low energy light and emit a high energy photon, high energy light. Such materials, what's actually needed is some sort of intermediate uh, excited state, an intermediate state that is, has a, a, that is relatively stable, so that on absorption of one photon or a bit of low energy light, you can hang around for long enough in this state to absorb another photon to get to a high energy whereby once you get emission from there, this uh, photon would be high in energy than both the initial two absorbed photons. Yeah, so that's how uh, upconversion can work. Uh, and one of the ways to, uh, one of the mechanisms that this happens is this uh, so-called triplet-triplet annihilation of conversion. And I won't try to explain the mechanism of this here, except just to say that with this particular mechanism, there's a lot of design of molecules involved, which I love. But also, in this particular upconversion mechanism, you can, in fact, see relatively efficient low energy to high energy uh, photon conversion with low power of the incident light. So that's important because you want to be using sunlight to do the up conversion. And uh, these pictures look nice, but maybe a little bit misleading in the sense that these pictures are illustrated using a laser, so laser usually higher power. But uh, I can tell you that uh, with um, the current status of technology now, uh, efficiency is okay, uh, even if you were using um, the level of power that is the same as um, uh, what we're getting from the sun. Yeah, so we can convert you know, green light into blue light, uh, red light into yellow light, green light into red light, depending on the molecules we choose. There's still quite a lot of research, however, that we still need to do. I mean, we can do some estimates and predictions as to uh, how far we can push this. So there's one, some estimates out there that says that we can improve the efficiency of a silicon solar cell to up to 40%, assuming many things, but that's a good aim to go for. At currently, silicon solar cells are sitting around 26%, but if we can get to 40%, that's fantastic. The problem is uh, the efficiency of this upconversion process uh, is actually only around 60%, so we're definitely not going to get to this number 40 here if the upconversion process itself is only at 60 so there's room for improvement there. There's also plenty of research still that needs to be done on tuning the color of these materials, or at least finding the right material with the right color to match things, uh, to match solar cells like a silicon solar cell, uh, and still maintain a good level of efficiency. 
And yeah, so all these points here, these three points here, is uh, as research that's going on uh, um, in the Exciton Science Center. Now, so that, that's converting low energy photons into high energy photons uh, and making solar cells more efficient. Uh, we can also then, uh, I spoke about, use the high energy photons more efficiently and not have this heat loss. So one way to do that is via this multi-exciton generation or singlet fission. So what happens here is uh, if you have the appropriately designed materials, you can absorb a high energy photon into the material, create an exciton. This high energy exciton can split into two exitons of uh, half the energy of the uh, high energy exciton. And then we can use this perhaps uh, then in a, this energy, say, in a solar cell to get uh, electrical current. And in fact, uh, this fission process uh, uh, has been demonstrated to be quite efficient in certain materials. Uh, and in fact, some of the challenges at the moment is to how do we couple these single fission materials, and typically uh, these are, uh, a lot of these single fission materials are organic materials, how to couple these to, uh, say, a silicon solar cell. And with this particular method, one estimate says that we can improve a silicon solar cell from 26% to 32.5%. So if you were to combine both uh, up conversion and single efficient together with a solar cell, we can probably get to efficiency levels like a multi-junction solar cell or even slightly better. Uh, and since these materials that we're using for upconversion and for single fission are organic materials um, that hopefully we can uh, deposit as fin films on silicon um, solar cells, it would be cheap, uh, both in terms of cost and energy. Other than using emerging technologies in large scale applications, it can also be used in smaller applications so uh, some of these newer technologies, particularly I would say these luminescent solar concentrators, are much more suited to urban environments. They can harvest low levels of, uh, low levels of sunlight more efficiently. Um, they're colorful, so people would like more likely to have them on buildings. So you know, we could have facades of buildings that are collecting energy. In my research, in, this, in, in the research of the Exoton Science Center, we're also interested in looking at this particular light harvesting device, so-called luminescent solar concentrator. It is actually a very simple device, and uh, those uh, items there on the table, they are luminescent solar concentrators. It's just a fluorescent dye dispersed in a plastic matrix. How, how are we doing light harvesting with these devices? Well, the fluorescent dye absorbs light, the emission from these fluorescent dye is trapped inside the plastic matrix by total internal reflection, kind of like you know, what happens in an optic fiber, like just trapped in an optic fiber. The emission then is channeled to the ed edges of those devices, and you might see that those, some of those pieces are brighter on the edges. On the edges is where you can then attach perhaps solar cells to convert the emission into electrical current. So what's interesting about these type of device is that uh, it's very different to so, traditional solar concentrators where you need mirrors. So uh, it, it's less bulky. It doesn't require cooling. Traditional concentrators need cooling. So it's more interesting for uh, applications where you want to integrate these devices with something. However, it is definitely much, much lower in efficiency than things like this. There are a lot of loss mechanisms uh, in such uh, luminescent solar concentrated devices, and that's one of the things that we're working on. And yeah, just show you a few pictures here of, uh, this is actually a demonstrator that an Italian energy company ha have already constructed, and uh, it's a luminescent solar concentrator charging station for an electric bike, I think. It's an interesting application for it. Other types of applications you might want to think about for luminescent solar color concentrators is maybe as architectural features. So uh, there's this picture here. I don't know where this building is, but looks nice. Uh, this picture here is one that maybe most of you recognize uh, in the city. 
uh, on uh, Elizabeth Street. Um, and uh, this is a picture of uh, an extension of my house that I'm <laughs> building right now. Uh, it's got some color uh, plastic on the facade. Unfortunately, it's not fluorescent uh, perspex yet, um, but I guess in future, um, if uh, we develop this technology at a certain level, I might be able to have this uh, on a part of my house. So we've built some demonstrators at the University of Melbourne. Uh, here's a uh, luminescent solar concentrator clock. Without a battery, probably it's not so useful as a clock, but anyway. Uh, oh yeah, so um, I forgot to mention, these devices work well under low and diffuse light. So that's, and under indoor conditions, it's ideal for this sort of device. Uh, we made one that is sort of desktop size where we can charge, I would have to admit, probably more like trickle charge and charge a mobile phone at this stage. Um, and we also made a, a A0 size device uh, and uh, certainly under full sun, um, it's outputting 7.7 you know, 7 volts and 55 milliamps. So it's definitely, you can charge mobile phones with that sort of power. And what's more is uh, we, on this particular demonstrator, we've put some LEDs on the frame. So during the day, we can collect the uh, energy, store it in a battery in the frame, and at night, the battery will run some LEDs, and then it can become sort of an advertising hoarding. So that's perhaps an interesting application when used for this. Stability is always a question with emerging technologies. And as with emerging technologies, um, work is being done to improve the stability. So I guess an example is uh, organic solar cells. So these polymer solar cells that uh, one can um, print roll to roll into large area and flexible at low costs. Um, yes, they're going to be less stable than silicon, um, but it's already been shown that they have uh, lifetimes in the 10 year range, 10 to 15 year range. Um, so yes, they need to be replaced, but not every other day. Okay, so uh, just to finish up, so you know, what is the ultimate light harvesting device? I've talked about uh, solar cells coupled with up converters and uh, uh, um, single efficient materials, and that's certainly something that we are working very strongly on in the Exoton Science Center. It could be organic solar cells um, that has one day energy payback time, or it could be these perovskite solar cells that are solar showing great efficiency, they're solution processable. Um, it may be solar fuel devices where we convert sunlight directly into liquid fuels. I think that's an important challenge. Or maybe we should just plant more trees. I don't think that's probably a great idea to cover all our energy needs. But I think we need to uh, think about all renewable energy technologies and it's definitely going to play an important role in our future energy mix. Um, yeah, so thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks for that. That was a, a good overview. Uh, I've been working in the area for a, a number of years and I'm involved in some very large scale projects and it was a good summary across a few areas. Yeah. Um, one, question, one question just about a slide and another question about speculation. First question, slide 36. Mm -hmm. You talk about two different types of efficiency, I think. Um, one was uh, a potential efficiency of 40% for, I think that was for a crystalline silicon cell. If you have the, uh, maybe if you can go back to 36 Cesius. If, if you, yeah. uh, the way I interpreted that, but please correct me, um, if you start with a 26% efficiency mm. for a solar cell as it is today, yeah. and you can have a 60% efficiency of up conversion, then you get 40%. Is that, no, that so works? No, the, so the first dot point here, the estimates actually from uh, some, the maximum theoretical efficiency for silicon, so that's, um, or actually, not, I don't even think 
necessary for selection. I would just have to check that. But it's a theoretical efficiency is not the best device, demonstrated device efficiency. Uh, and then uh, they add it on top of that. So it's around from about 30% efficient up to around 40% if you, if, if you have an ideal up-conversion system. Uh, so it will be much lower than that if you say that the up-conversion is only 60% efficient. So the Shockley limit is about 30%, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, so how do you move from the 30 to the 40, I guess, uh, I was trying to follow? It's in this particular publication there. <laughs> <laughs> the one at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. What's the physical mechanism? I'm a physicist. Um, I think it's an in estimate. In a misspent right? youth. So, uh, what's the physics of it? So, I think it's from a very it's a very simple model. So, you if you um, have a solar cell at thirty percent efficiency, you throw away uh, everything that is uh, um, below the band gap, then it's thirty. And if you can harvest everything above the band gap, but okay. then, yeah. Okay. Um, and the, the other question was related to, I guess, organic luminescence, organic um, PV systems, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, has, has there been any thought about uh, combining things like cloning of organic uh, of cells or bugs together with um, organic PV cells to actually be able to continuously produce maybe a lower efficiency but at a very low cost because that's a central issue with, for instance, triple junction or, or, or four junction solar cells. You can get that in great efficiency but they just can't get anywhere near commerciality. If you could take the other approach and be able to produce things that are very cheap but can be rolled out um, at a lesser efficiency, that could, that could uh, really change the game. Yeah, so you, you can definitely make multi-junction organic solar cells and, and people do that. Um, and in theory, uh, you can design the not organic compound to absorb a certain wavelength range so you can have more easily more junctions and the more junctions you have the higher the efficiency of course that complicates the device structure but if you're printing it all then may, that may not matter that might still be cheap yeah i don't know about combining um biological systems with organic solar cells <laughs> it's more about the sort of production mechanism than than you know system as it ends up it's like, yeah. All your work has basically been looking at solar cell efficiencies at effectively sea level or mm. the normal level. Yep. Yep. Um, the Airbus function I went to this morning at the Solatron, Australian Solatron, they are talking about their solar plane um, up in the upper atmosphere levels and higher, and that plane, I can't remember the exact number, but it was nearly 52 days or something of flying there with um, not coming down. Mm. And they're looking for other ways to try and get more efficiency out of the solar cells, the higher you get up and what contamination the radiation levels at that high altitude play on the efficiency of current ground level solar panels. Mm. Yeah, I have, to, I have to say, I don't, I don't know much about solar cells and its applications near space or in space. Uh, I think there's some interest. Um, yeah, I can't think of a name off the top of my head, but yeah, there's certainly some interest. Maybe I'll ask Professor Rob Day, who's a member of our council, to come and propose a vote of thanks. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, overjoyed to, to hear this, this uh, amazing summary. And um, so I want to thank Wallace Wong. I've learnt what an exojoule is. I didn't know that before. I've learnt what a terawatt is and the, sol the size of the solar flux. But you kept us a long time before you actually told us what the exotron really was. And I know that there are at least some of us in our audience, who came especially found out what this exciting exotron was. So we finally found out, and we've learnt a lot. And thank you very much indeed for for uh, showing us through it. So.
So, thank you. When can we uh, stop relying on fossil fuels? Very soon, we can do that because the technology is already there. Um, in some cases, uh, we need the infrastructure um, and the services that would be involved in using uh, renewable energy. Once energy cost is high enough uh, and uh, you know, the, the solar technologies are low cost enough, then it will just switch. Of course, with uh, government policy and incentives, that is going to accelerate things a little bit more, but uh, we're running out of fossil fuels. That's only going to get more expensive. So if we have cheaper renewable energy, people would take it up.